This is Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast where we bring Jesus into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hey guys, welcome to Sports Spectrum. I am Jason Romano. My email address, jason at sportspectrum.com. I'd love to hear from you. Any ideas on future guests, any thoughts on today's interview with Austin Davis, you can email me, jason at sportspectrum.com. And we are presented today by IJM, the International Justice Mission. And right now, as children and families are staying home, there are just too many that are in unsafe situations and in lockdown and online sex trafficking of children and domestic abuse are on the rise. And right now, IJM is trying to meet the urgent needs of people vulnerable to violence during COVID-19. And here's a great way for you to partner with IJM and become a freedom partner and joining them in their work against ending slavery in our lifetime. Check out IJM.org slash TF, IJM.org slash TF to become a freedom partner today. Austin Davis is our guest today on Sports Spectrum. Philadelphia Phillies pitcher made his Major League Baseball debut June 20th, 2018 with Philadelphia against the Cardinals, selected four years earlier in the 12th round of the 2014 MLB draft. And he came out of Cal State University Bakersfield, the first Cal State Bakersfield baseball player to ever play in Major League Baseball. A couple interesting notes on Austin. He worked his way through the minor league system and grinded through low A, double A, triple A, high A ball, all the way to the major leagues in places like Lakewood, New Jersey, and Clearwater, Florida, Reading, Pennsylvania, and the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs, triple A affiliate of the Philadelphia Phillies. And then in 2018, got the call. In 2019, Got the call again. He was in the minors and then came up and pitched in the major leagues. And in 2020, is on his way, hopefully, to securing a spot with the Philadelphia Phillies on the big league club. The other note that's interesting to me about Austin is he's not on social media. No social media at all. We didn't talk about this during our recording, but after we stopped recording, I just asked him about being on social media and if we could tag him and, and post this interview and, uh, you know, help people find his social media pages. And he doesn't have social media. He didn't want it. He says it's just too distracting. And in many ways, I cannot agree with him more. Uh, so I appreciate Austin Davis's honesty. And this is a, a fun conversation with a guy who's been through it all. And he shares some really awesome stories of being a minor league baseball player. And then what it was like June 20th, 2018, to take the ball for the first time as a big league pitcher. Take a listen to Austin Davis, his faith journey, his baseball journey. It's intersected right here on Sports Spectrum. Take a listen. Austin, welcome to Sports Spectrum. Thanks for having me. It's good to talk to you. Good to see you taping these on Zoom, uh, which it seems like everybody, I wish we could go back right to like February, Austin, and maybe put some money down into the Zoom world because we probably will both be pretty rich right now right (laughs) yeah yeah we missed out on that we did but that's all right you were getting ready for a baseball season that's now been placed on pause um let me ask you let's start there with your baseball journey it's 2020 we've never seen a 2020 like we've or any year like 2020 has been let's go back to maybe how it started for you in January where your mindset was as you were getting ready for uh, this year and maybe where it's brought to you now both preparing for a, a shortened baseball season soon hopefully but also just everything else that's been going on yeah um well it's interesting i had a pretty uh, rough year as far as statistics go um pitching wise last year and i was actually the, the very last month of the season i felt like i got to a spot that i i thought hey this this is going to work for me and now the off season is just about building on that, reiterating those mechanics, sticking with those. And so come January, I was super excited about spring training, um, super excited about the new staff we had with Girardi and Brian Price, our, our new pitching coach, and uh, just a bunch of great guys. And then uh, the relationships I've built with those guys over the last couple of years, it's now year three. And so I felt like, hey, we're going to have a pretty fun year this year. We're going to be good. And I feel like I'm going to be able to contribute. And then uh, we get to spring, spring's going well, and then all of a sudden, bam, it gets shut down. Um, And so for me, just like from a selfish perspective, I was really excited about the season because I felt like 
I was in a good position to help the team win some games uh, and at least contribute where I could. And so for it to get shut down was uh, just interesting because you feel like you, you try and control everything you can control. And then so many things are out of your hands. We just take them for granted. Like the fact that we don't have a global pandemic and this year we do. So I could put all the work in on the field and do all the things I need to do. But, you know, we obviously see we just don't have any control over circumstances sometimes. Where were you the last time you were wearing a uniform? Take me to look to that last game and finding out that, uh, or not even, maybe you didn't find out when you were playing in your last game, but just knowing that uh, this was swirling. Certainly there was games being played as this was starting to creep up into the lexicon of all of our psyches and the news and all that. So take me to that last game. Yeah, well, we were actually on the road. I don't know, we had maybe like a week of spring left. Um, and I was pitching that day. And we saw uh, NBA was shutting down. Dang, NBA shutting down. I wonder if, if baseball is even going to consider this. And we thought, no, nah, probably not. Baseball will just keep pushing through. We haven't played our season yet. We'll, we'll be able to do whatever we need to do. And then we went out for the game. I pitched. And then I came back in after I pitched and was doing the stuff I needed to do. And then they had TVs up. And it was MLB, you know, put season on pause. Wait, what? <laughs> like I was just out there pitching, and now it's like it's like spring training canceled. I was like, I don't, I don't think so. I, I literally just pitched, but wow, um, yeah. So kind of crazy. And then uh, we took the bus ride home. Everyone was trying to figure out what was going on, and that was Thursday. And then I was back home in Arizona by Saturday. So pretty pretty quick turnaround. Just everything shut down, and we were out. Some guys I've talked to have said they hung out for a little bit. Others just decided to stay. This is both major and minor league players. Um, and there was a lot of uncertainty, especially initially, on what this was going to be like. At what point did you realize this might be another offseason? And, and really, that's what it's turned into. You geared up, you geared up, you geared up. And I'm not saying that you're treating it as though it's an off season, but suddenly it's now been multiple months. We're taping this and recording this at the very beginning of summer. And we're three plus months into this thing now. What was that like for you to kind of have to realize, Oh my gosh, all right, this isn't just a couple of weeks and we'll get right back at it. Although there were some thoughts that that might be what it was going to be. Yeah. Well, so my wife had actually gone home for a wedding on uh, just a couple of days prior. And so when all this happened, I thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to go home because if they, I, I, we didn't know if they were going to shut down travel. If, you know, I'm in Arizona and spring trainings in Florida. So I didn't know, you know, if, is she going to be stuck out there and I'll be stuck out here. So I go home and I thought, okay, well, I'll go home. It was Saturday and then I'll just, see what happens next couple of days. I'll probably book a flight Monday, Tuesday, and we'll get back and um, we'll kind of just slowly ease back into it. And we'll be ready to go in a couple of weeks. And then what's interesting is I never felt like I looked more than like two weeks ahead. I was like, okay, well, we got the March deal in place. We'll get going by April. Okay. We'll get going by mid April. All right. Early May. And then just like each like two week period. And <laughs> here we are. And it's funny when I, when I, I uh, got the opportunity to do this interview with you. I was like, okay, well, that'll be, I'll be in Philly. So that'll be East coast time. Uh, <laughs> right. So that'll be, that'll be, you know, and then um, getting ready for it this morning, I was like, oh, dang, I'm still here. I, I forgot. I assumed I was going to be in Philly. Like, oh, no, no chance. I'll be home still. Well, I appreciate you waking up early as we're taping this <laughs> early in the morning. And I'm realizing now when you told me you were in Arizona, that it's, it's very early for you. And baseball players don't do very early, at least during the season. Maybe in the off season they might, but during the season, you're not talking or even remotely thinking about calling a guy usually until after at least 9 or 10 o'clock. Let me ask you this, Austin. What's been the, you know, we're going to talk about your faith in a minute, and I kind of want to get through that journey on what uh, – uh, in terms of you coming to the Lord and kind of beginning that, that faith journey. But what's the great wake-up call that the Lord has, has shown you during all of this quarantining? What's, what's been the one thing that he's kind of impressed upon your heart? Like, all right, multiple months into this now, this is where God's been when showing me or teaching me. Yeah, you know, there's been a lot, um, especially with, you know, we have quarantine and then we have, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think Yes. For, for me, it's getting out of my own bubble of baseball and seeing what other people are going through and being willing to listen and understand like different perspectives. So 
growing up in Scottsdale, um, pretty affluent area, um, not a whole lot of diversity here. And then going to college and then playing professional, you know, baseball, it's a very small window of people you interact with. And, you know, actually going to pro ball was cool to understand where the Latin guys are coming from, but, you know, them from the Dominican, Mexico, Venezuela. Um, but, but for, you know, our black brothers and sisters around here to see what, you know, their perspective is in, um, you know, and I think that's just the big thing for me is, oh, well, I don't have this gr broad perspective of what's going on in the world. I only understand what's going on in my own life. And I need to kind of wake up to that and uh, see what I can do to help out and be a part. Is there anything you did specifically? I know for me, I'm, I, I've been fortunate to have, and I grew up similar to you, not an affluent town, I would say, but in a very predominantly white town with a little diversity. And I needed to go and find, um, you know, I learned, I guess, in my own way uh, that my whiteness was real and that I needed to have more diversity in my life. This was more at my younger age, certainly working at places like ESPN and even working in sports ministry now. You know, I feel like I'm, I have a lot of close friends now, people in the faith who are black and are brothers and sisters in Christ with me. And so I've been talking to them and trying to have conversations, whether it's through this show or just calling them and texting them and saying, how can I be better? What, what, what questions do I need to be asking? Have, has you, have you had that kind of taking shape for you in just trying to be intentional, I guess, about learning more, even watching YouTube videos. Like that's been something I've been doing a lot of or videos or documentaries or movies. Have, has that been the case for you? Yeah, I think education is probably the where I'm at right now. So I I got a couple books. Uh, I'm a big reader, so I thought, okay, well, I'll spend. You know, usually I'm reading something in like the Christian subgenre of, you know, not self help, but you know, self transformation or or just you know, Christian book. And so sure. I thought, okay, well, this is a time to kind of focus my energy on this and see what I can't learn and. Um, and then when I see, you know, what's going on in the news and the media, understanding that, uh, what's going on with baseball too, you know, the perspective isn't always, isn't always fully represented in the media. So what, what is actually going on? What, what do they care about? Yeah. What are they trying to fight for and how can I partner with them? And so that's, you know, that's where I'm at with it. And I mean, I don't, I haven't done anything really tangible, but I feel like, uh, education is, is a good base because then from there you can have intelligent conversations and actual, you know, change and movement and support. So I would agree completely education and lamenting. One of the pastors that I talked to just said, it's okay to lament and just be in that phase of, of really weeping with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn, like the word says. So I think that's been important as well. Austin Davis is our guest here today on Sports Spectrum. Let's learn your journey, about your journey a little bit. You were a 12th round pick in 2014 to Philadelphia out of Cal State Bakersfield. So let's go back to that moment maybe for you, and then we'll come from, from baseball into faith. So what emotions or thoughts stand out for you from that day, uh, being out of Cal State Bakersfield, coming to Philly and getting, and getting that call on that 12th round? Yeah, obviously pretty crazy day. You know, it's one of those things that everyone – dreams of growing up playing baseball um, and I went to Cal State Bakersfield which is a smaller division one school and so it was perfect for me because they had a nice leash on me I could kind of go there and make a lot of mistakes and figure some things out so I'm grateful for my time there um, and I definitely made some so <laughs> as we all have Austin right <laughs> yeah so and it's you know what's interesting is I grew up going to church uh, my family went to church on Sundays but I definitely wouldn't say I had a faith of my own uh, for almost all of college. Definitely not in high school at all. You know, you, you know, when you're a kid growing up, your parents take you to church, and you know, it is what it is. But yeah. it was my junior year um, in the fall that I got connected with FCA, and then um, actually had three or four teammates on on my team at Bakersfield that were awesome, solid Christian guys. And that's when I first would say that I started following Jesus in the way that. I live my life. And so to go from following, uh, just starting to follow Jesus in the fall to getting drafted in the spring, it was just, it was really interesting because I, there was this pressure that I put on myself. I'm like a type A, go, 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 put a lot of pressure on myself. And that's obviously helped me be successful. But 
when you're holding on so tight, you can't, you know, succeed in the ways you need to. And so starting to follow Jesus and saying, Hey, this, you know, there's more to life than all of, all of this. If you fail, you're not a failure, you know, these, these kinds of things um, really impacted the way I saw the draft. And it was kind of like a affirmation that, you know, following Jesus is true life and the draft day was awesome um but it was it was kind of coupled with this see what you were able to accomplish while you were just letting go and not holding on so tight so it was really really special day from that perspective that's really good because 12th round that's a lot a lot of weight and it's not you know 40th round but still the 12th round that's a that's a time that you have to spend being patient um trusting that god has a plan and all that can you kind of walk me through those emotions because i have to imagine being human you'd still like to say hey i'm i'm a third rounder i'm a first rounder i'm a fifth rounder whatever and it comes till 12 and obviously you're grateful for an opportunity but can you walk me through maybe just as you saw round two and three and four go by and you still hadn't been called yeah i mean i think everyone believes that they got like screwed in the draft i think everyone thinks <laughs> I mean, I was, I'm a fourth rounder and I don't know how I slipped to the 12th, but that's what happened. But, uh, right. that was kind of my, my story too, is people were telling me, Hey, you're going to go somewhere between the fourth and the sixth for this dollar amount and all this stuff. And then the first, the first day is the first and second round. The second day is the second or the third through the 10th round. Oh. So then I, I go two full days without getting drafted. And I was just, <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm going back to school. Like, it looks like I'm going, I'm going back for my senior year. And then early day three, um, got picked and, and it was, it was, it was really cool, but there was this, you know, chip on the shoulder kind of thing. Like, Oh, like the league thinks I'm a 12th rounder. Okay. Well, let's, let's go see if I can show them wrong. So hmm. uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty funny, just up and down experience from that, that perspective too. We'll get back to our conversation with Austin Davis in just a little bit, we want to tell you some more about our friends at IJM, the International Justice Mission. Believing every person deserves to be safe and free from violence, and unfortunately, violence is on the rise with COVID-19 and people stuck in some really difficult situations. But here's what IJM does. They partner with local authorities to rescue victims of violence, to bring criminals to justice, to restore survivors, and to strengthen justice systems. They're helping to protect more than 150 million people from violence across the world, and it cannot be done alone. They need your help. They need our help to join this fight. And Freedom Partners are some of IJM's most loyal partners in the work of justice, and you can become a Freedom Partner right now. Your support of $24 or more each month helps survivors of slavery and violence from the moment they're rescued until they're fully restored. If you want to join the fight right now to end slavery in our lifetime, you can visit the website, ijm.org slash tf, ijm.org slash tf, and become a freedom partner today. Now back to our conversation with Austin Davis from the Philadelphia Phillies, joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. So you get to professional baseball, and I've I just I've heard stories early on when, when somebody first starts their pro career, and it's like eye-opening, especially for high schoolers, right? At least you had some maturity that you had take place in college, but it's still eye-opening that suddenly you're going off into this, this world of professional baseball that isn't glamorous early on. It sounds glamorous, but it's not, especially in those first couple years when you're playing in those those smaller places in these towns, you know, Lakewood, the Blue Claws and Clearwater and the Redding Fighting Phils. I know that's double A, but there's still small towns and small areas. And again, it's not glamorous. So walk us through early on, you become this professional baseball player. Your faith is still new and kind of where all that's intersecting for you as you become a pro ball player. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So I got drafted. I showed up to the spring training complex on the minor league side. And the way it works for most guys is they go there, they get kind of settled, and they go up to, for us, it's Williamsport. And they'll go up there and play the short season team. Well, we drafted only exclusively college guys that draft year and one high school kid signed. And so I was one of the lucky guys who got to stay back in the Gulf Coast League, which is the basically it's spring training. You play at 12 o'clock. Um, at the spring training complexes on the backfields in the middle of the summer in Florida. And I thought, this is not what I signed up for. <laughs> <laughs> you made it to the hundredth you know, degree, right? <laughs> yeah. 
and I'm from Arizona where it's hot, but I've never experienced humidity. You know, I, Bakersfield is pretty similar, pretty dry, dry place. So I'm in Florida. Just, I mean, I don't think I stopped sweating for the three months I was there, whether I was in a hotel room or at the field, it was just constant sweat. And so that was kind of a wake up call. Of, oh, this isn't like you show up and there's like thousands of fans waiting out to get your autograph. Like I remember there's guys there with, you know, autograph books and they're in a, league like that they're getting the first rounders the high prospect guys and I every day I walked by I didn't sign one autograph the whole first year and I was like <laughs> oh this is like I thought I was you know I, I just got drafted I'm like they, they need me like I'm gonna be in Philly in a year or two like you know they need some left-handed pitching and I remember you know people are texting you like hey how's Philly I'm like oh no I'm I'm in Florida I've got like seven levels to go before I didn't even like they even know who I am so yeah. It's, little, it's, little check to the ego, not signing an autograph, maybe, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, big check to the ego. And then, and then that was 2014. 2015, I went to Lakewood, which is actually a pretty cool town up in New Jersey. Great place to play. Played a full season there um, and watched some guys kind of funnel up ahead of me, and I stayed there the whole year. So I was like, okay, well, this is going to be a longer journey than I thought. And then the next year, I got hurt, and so I went back to Lakewood. So now, Two, two years into this thing, and I've only gone up one level, and I was starting to think, wow, like, <laughs> they say it's going to be long, but I've only gone up one level, and I still got four to go. So, you know, is this really going to happen? And that was the first time I really thought of, do I want to play baseball for a career as my job? You know, I love playing baseball, I love pitching, but, you know, am I going to put 100% into this all the time? And I decided, yeah, I'm going to do that. And so from there, then – I did whatever I had to do to figure out how to, you know, throw strikes and, and get guys out. And luckily I got some good opportunities and here I am I'm trying to make the most of it. What's the toughest part or what was the toughest part? And it continues to be a tough part, I'm sure, for you to stay the course, trusting in God when you're grinding it out, especially during those minor league dog days of summer um, that you have gone through for many years. What's the toughest part on just staying the course and really from a faith perspective saying, okay, God, you're you're in control and I trust you, but what's going on here? Show me why isn't this happening or why, why isn't, you know, uh, why isn't, why am I not moving further enough as quickly as I would like or whatever? What's, what's the toughest part in that staying that course and trusting in God? Yeah, I think for me at that time, one, I was still young. I mean, I still am young, but I was 22, 23. And so my, you know, my expectations were just completely off, but two, you know, you, you talk about faith and you talk about these things, you know, like God's in control and you have, especially early on in my faith, you have these like bumper sticker things you can throw out there when something doesn't go right, but it actually does, you know, suck. Like it actually hurts yeah. to, you know, it actually hurts to, you know, put countless hours into something and then go up and give up four runs in an inning and not make it out of two innings as a starter or something. And so for me, it was, you know, it's easy to have faith when things are going well, and it's easy to have faith when you can kind of distance yourself from it. But when I really cared, you know, and I, re and I really failed, that was, I think that was kind of a, a benchmark moment for me on faith of like, do I really believe this? Because now I actually do have to put my trust in God. I can't just say it because when you're being, when you're successful and you're just saying, oh, I put my trust in God, like it, it sounds nice, it's good. But when you're actually in the thick of it, it's, uh, you know, when you've got, $20 in your bank account and like a thousand dollars in credit card debt and you're texting your family again to see if they can send you some money. You know, it's like, why am I doing this? You mm -hmm. know? And so I feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm having a good time, but it's actually tough. You know, I think being so young, you don't realize what it means to actually go through anything. Um, and so, and I don't, I don't know if I still really do understand what it means to truly suffer, but to fail and see yourself as a failure and then try and pull yourself up um, and, and let God kind of do that work was, was probably the toughest, toughest thing for me. Austin Davis is joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. We talked about this before we started recording, but minor league baseball stories, to me at least, are unending, I think. I've talked to so many guys and the stories that they share, man, there could be like 10 books literally written about just these stories that, that guys go through uh, as they play minor league baseball. So you've been through it. You mentioned Lakewood, Clearwater, Redding, 
Lehigh Valley, the minor league hubs, if you will, and some of the places that you've gone through. Uh, interestingly enough, still consistently through the same system with the Phillies. You haven't been traded or, or anything like that yet. And maybe someday it will, maybe someday it won't happen. But so let's hear a minor league story. Let's hear your story. When people ask you, man, what is it like to be a minor league player? Give me a story that you could share with our audience that kind of signifies the minor league life and maybe something that you've gone through. Yeah. So there's tons of stories that come to mind. I think one funny one that involves my wife is, which is always a dangerous place to start, but it's okay. <laughs> um, we were, <laughs> we were engaged at the time. And so she, she's in Arizona um, and she was flying out to see me in Reading and we were in uh, somewhere in Ohio, Akron, I think maybe. And so we were driving back from Akron. We had a night game, game ends at 10, get on the road by 11. We're planning to get back four or five in the morning or whatever. And she's flying in from Reading or flying in from Phoenix to Reading. So she flies to Philly, has to get a rental car. Um, and then she was meeting up with one of my teammates' wife because we were, we were both gone. And so they were going to stay there. And then I was going to go and pick her up. And so we're, we're driving, we're driving through the night and I'm trying to text her and stuff, see how things are going, but she's driving. So, you know, it's kind of, I mean, I really didn't hear from her. I'm like, I don't know where she is. I don't know if she's, you know, a little know her, whatever it was. So she lands in Philly, gets the rental car, and she starts driving. And I'm like, okay, so she's probably got an hour and a half until she's in Reading. Perfect. You know, we got, I don't know how long, it was probably three hours left. So it was like maybe an hour and a half buffer. So this is great. Well, our car, our bus breaks down in the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. And so the bus pulls over. We're, we're stuck there. We end up sitting there for like two and a half hours waiting for, we had to wait for another bus to come and they had to switch all the luggage and, and then we're, we're coming back. So now we're looking at five, six in the morning, you know, maybe, maybe seven, eight at this time getting in. And so, um, I get a call from my wife, her name's Jordan. So I get a call from Jordan and she's crying and I'm like, ah, oh, no, what's going on? And she had driven an hour and a half east and she was up somewhere near New York instead of driving an hour and a half northwest oh, no. and I guess like, the address had gotten messed up so she had driven an hour and a half the wrong way and she's never been she's lived in DC for a little bit but never in like the Philly area up towards New York anything it's 12 o'clock at night pitch black she has no idea where she is we're stuck on a bus on the side of the road um well, who knows where and it ended up all working out. She drove and she ended up being in the car for like six hours trying to find her way back to Reading. She finds Reading, gets there, gets there safe. We get, we get in like seven in the morning and then we went and got some brunch and just kind of moved forward as if <laughs> nothing happened. And so that was my wife's first experience of like, oh, this, I, like, where's all the fans and where's all the cool stuff and where's all the, you know, it's getting in at seven in the morning. She's getting in at three in the morning and, and then we had a game the next day. I think I pitched the next night and we kept rolling. And she's like, this is, why are you doing this? You know? Oh, right, right. <laughs> what are you, what are, why are you signing up for this? So, That's yeah. funny. That's funny. Can you give me one more? You said a bunch of stories came to your mind. Maybe one more just minor league story. It could be, I don't know, wherever, wherever your mind takes you, give us one more. Yeah. Um, let's think. So when I was in Lakewood, we were in um, – Lakewood, New Jersey. We were staying with a host family in Jackson, and uh, in Jackson, New Jersey, is huge Hasidic Jew community. And so, you know, on on Sabbath, they don't drive anywhere, they don't do anything. And so, we showed up first first uh, first weekend, and we show up. They have all these, you know, Hasidic Jews wearing classic garb and stuff. They have like these big hats, and so we were like, hey, where where are we? We haven't, I haven't seen any of this in my life before. Sure. And it was one crazy to see that, you know, they take Sabbath so seriously. So I think that's, you know, something that the church needs to do a better job of is really committing to Sabbath. But, you know, it's, it's ice cold there, you know, first weekend we're there, it's New Jersey, it's early April, it's snowing. Um, and I'm the first one out of the bullpen first day, game opening day and Lakewood's bullpen is on the field. And it's on the field, and when you're throwing, you're throwing towards the dugout. And so they call down and say, hey, Austin, get going. Um, you're coming in. You know, you got, like, five minutes to get loose. So I just start chucking balls as hard as I could, trying to get loose. 
from Arizona, never, never been in the cold before, let alone the snow. And the, the, they don't, we didn't have walkie talkies. We just had signals. So like each guy had a different signal for the, you know, we want you to get loose. And so our pitching coach comes out of the dugout and he's looking down to see if I'm ready to go. And I just air mail the ball way well over the catcher had no chance of catching it. And the open coach walks up and then the ball is coming right at him. And he like has to use the railing, jump out of the way. And then he like lands, he looks at me, he throws his hands up and I was like, I'm good. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's go. And so did you go uh, in? Did he I, actually put you in? He put me in. I blew the game. Oh. And that was, that was my start to my first, uh, you know. Yeah, we had, what was funny was I blew the game, and then we ended up coming back and winning because it was the fifth, sixth inning. But I came in, guys on base, gave up a base hit, walked a guy or something, which surprising if I'm air, air, air mailing balls all over the place that I walked a guy. But uh, so I got to go in and – and that was that was like the start to my first full season of pro ball was being in a community I've never seen you know anyone's faith like this acidic Jew faith I was like wow this is this is something I've never experienced before this is new and then pitching in the snow was like completely new and then getting hot we have like our clubby bringing hot chocolate down to us but I was getting loose so I just missed the hot chocolate so it was it was like a crazy first three four days of like wow I had no like this is something I've never been through before wow that's an amazing story and crazy to think about just being in cold northeast weather when you grew up in Arizona and haven't actually gotten that experience yet to have to go up to the northeast and now you have because you went through um Redding which is in Pennsylvania Lehigh Valley of course and then I want to take it to June 20th 2018 and I know I don't even have to really probably tell you anything about that date in terms of reminding you what took place, but that's the day where you make your major league baseball debut. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could, cause I love this, this question. I ask it to as many baseball players as possible because everybody has a unique story of getting the call to the show. So what's your story getting the call to the show? Yeah. So, um, What's interesting at the time, we had this other lefty, Zach Curtis, who I love that guy. He's the best. Um, and we were doing this competition kind of thing where we ended up pitching on the same day a bunch. And so every time we pitched, whoever struck out more guys, we would just kind of talk trash to each other. And this day um, was – it was Sunday. We, had a, we were at home on a day game Sunday, off day Monday, at, and then playing at home Tuesday which like never happens. So you basically have like a whole day and a half off in this, in the season with no travel. Um, hmm. So I pitched that day, me and Zach were kind of talking trash back and forth about who's going to strike out more. He struck out more that day. And then uh, we were all going to someone's house for a barbecue and we were kind of lighting off fireworks and hanging out and like eating food, hot dogs and burgers, the whole thing, which like during the season, just like that does not happen. You know, we don't get like barbecue, like, you know, summer barbecue, classic stuff, like pool parties. We don't like that just doesn't happen because you're either traveling, you're playing at night or something. So to have a day game and then an off day the next day, we were, we were just pumped to have that. So we were eating, hanging out, setting off fireworks. And then we go home, me and my wife, and we got back to our apartment and this is father's day actually. Um, and so call my dad, we we're talking to him and uh wish him a happy father's day and then i got a call from our triple a manager and i was like hey like and i we've been on the phone with my dad for like i'm not kidding like 25 seconds like hey happy father's day what's going on oh actually i gotta go my manager's calling me and like he never calls me so something right that's up. very rare right <laughs> yeah and i was that's where i started to become suspicious i was like okay something's going on here like and i had so three weeks prior i'd just gotten sent back down to reading uh, because of roster space and so I got sent down to Reading and I just come back up for like a week and I thought oh geez like I'm I'm going back down to Reading this sucks and uh, he calls gives me the call lets me know I'm going to Philly um, and gives me all the details and all that stuff and it was just me and my wife and our our um, air mattress in our bedroom in an empty apartment and we thought wow this is I like, it was it was one of those moments where I like, it just gives you chills. It was amazing. I don't know if I was like laughing or crying or what was going on, but <laughs> right. my wife was never recorded. So she, she showed it to me the other day. It was pretty funny to look back on. Um, 
And then uh, I gave my dad a call back and then wished him happy Father's Day and told them. And so that was like a super cool Father's Day moment for him. And then from there, like chaos ensues. So it's like, hey, the guy that we're sending down doesn't know it yet. And so you're going to be taking, like, to go up, you have to take someone's spot. So, right. yeah. you know, you can't tell anyone really, but you have to get your family there. So my family is in Arizona and then my, my dad's in Arkansas. And so um, I called my agent, I called my parents, well, I called my parents and I called my agent and then um, called my trainer that I've been working with for since high school um, all the way through now and let them all know. And then they had to buy super expensive, you know, last minute flights to get out to Philly. Yeah. And um, all the while, like no one can say anything on social media or anything. So we have all this like excitement, but you have to kind of keep it on the down low. And then um, show up to the field the first time I'd never been to the stadium in Philly. Um, I was there. I just went to like the office buildings when I was there after I signed, but never been in the clubhouse, never been on the field. And I got there at like 3.30 right before pitcher stretch. And it was just like stretch, change, eat, get ready for the game and bam, you're out on the field. And it just, it was such a whirlwind. It was, it was insane. Did you and pitch luckily, that first night? No, luckily I, so that was actually the 18th. And then I pitched on the 20th. So I had a few days to kind of, you know, in, in, in AAA, the balls are a little different. So I got a chance to get used to the different seams. The seams are a little bit lower and just catch my breath. Um, but funny story, we pack up in Lehigh. We don't know how long this is going to be, but Philly had an off day a couple of days later. So we pack up everything we need to go. We're driving to the hotel, get like an hour and a half down the road. And for le le I remembered I left my suit in Lehigh. So I had to go all the way back to oh. Lehigh, which, you know, it's an hour, hour and a half. So I get all the way back to Lehigh, grab my suit, and then go. And so that was just a funny, like, the one thing you need, like, when you show up to Big League for the first time, you want, like, everyone talks about it. You just want to wear, like, you, you want to look nice. You want to wear a suit. You want to make a good impression. And I was <laughs> so rattled about what was going on. that I packed, like, all this unnecessary stuff and left my suit hanging in the, in the uh, apartment. So pretty Man. fun. Was there a guy that uh, helped put you at ease pretty quickly, a person that, whether it was a teammate uh, in Philadelphia or manager or, you know, even a clubhouse guy, was there somebody that kind of was there for you to kind of put you at ease and say, it's going to be all right. I know this is kind of crazy, but, you, you know, take a breath and I'm, I'm going to help you through this. You'll be all right. Was there somebody like that for you? You know, we had really, really good veterans on that team at that time. And, uh, we also had like a really big group of young guys. So it, it really, like it, it was intimidating. And I pitched on the same day that Arietta pitched. And if anyone has seen him pitch before, he looks super intimidating. He's super nice guy, but he looks like, like, just don't, just don't be around. Like, you know, like do not mess with this guy. Stone faced. Actually, yeah. yeah. He's actually a really, really nice guy. But in the bullpen, you know, the bullpen is kind of its own little community. And we had Adam Morgan, who I'd known a little bit. He was rehabbing my first year when I was down in Clearwater. So I got to meet him. And he's a guy, solid faith. And then our, uh, our veteran guy, Tommy Hunter, was – he'd been in the league for probably eight years at the time. And so he was really good at – especially when I was getting loose. He's like, hey, your adrenaline's pumping at like 1,000%. You're fine. Like, take a breath. Your body's loose. You just – you know – gather yourself before you go out there you don't need to throw any more pitches and so he was really good at kind of helping me wade through you know because you want to make sure you're fully ready to go but your heart rate's already at like a million so <laughs> you know you don't need to get your body loose anymore you just need to relax and calm down and so um really just the whole team as a whole was super inviting but um tommy and adam in the bullpen and our bullpen coach jim Gott, he's like the most calming presence uh, in the world so to have that little subset bullpen community was was really helpful as we wind down i gotta ask you about the moment um that you're called on to pitch that's it's like oh that's me i'm ready to go i have to get up here and it was a top of the seventh doing a little research tie game at three and you're called on it was against st louis i believe right the cardinals so what's the emotions that you're feeling at that moment and then you get on the and onto the onto the mound and you're ready to roll well, what was really scary was, one, it's Arietta pitching. And so I know it's a tie game. He's in the sixth inning at this point. 
And they called down and said, hey, get ready for the next lefty. And so I'm getting loose. Bases are loaded. One out. Lefty's on deck, I'm pretty sure. Might have, might have been two outs. But regardless, Jake ends up getting out of it. And I end up being able to go into a clean inning the next inning. But if he didn't get that guy out, I would have came in with the bases loaded or a couple guys on base in a one-run game or a tie game mm. to, like, I mean, a pretty significant game at that point in the season for us. We were in first place. Jake's throwing. He's a veteran guy. I don't want to ruin his game right off the bat, you know. And uh, <laughs> right. and then he gets out of it. And, like, oh, thank God. and then I had a full in, – in, you know, in the middle of the inning, you're just slinging it, getting it loose as quick as you can. And then I had a full half inning to kind of get loose and get ready to go. Um, but it, it's just like – it feels like no other outing. Like, the, no matter what anyone does in their debut, like – full grace there because it does not feel like at any other time pitching or hitting like your legs feel like jello but you're moving so fast so it's it's like you're you feel like it's totally out of whack but also totally like full of adrenaline like pretty sure I was sitting like 96 which at the time I was got I was more 93 94 guys so it was just like <laughs> everything was spiking up everything was moving all over the place my first pitch was straight to the dirt like it was <laughs> it was madness and then um, it was actually a perfect situation for me. I faced two lefties, gave up a hit to one, got the other one out, and then they just got me out of there, brought in this guy, Jerry Ramos, cleaned up the inning. And it was a nice, clean, like, hey, let's just get him in, get him out of there kind of outing. And it was, it was perfect. So That's it was good. fun. That's good. Last question for you here, and this has been great. Thanks so much for being generous with your time, Austin. What do you, what do you take away from that now that you've looked back, you know, appreciating – the opportunity to pitch in the majors, obviously, and you kind of went in 2019, you were in Lehigh and then in Philly and kind of back and forth. You said you didn't pitch as well as you would have liked last year. Um, but what do you take away now from those lessons on, because I've told people, I've talked to people who've gone from the minors to the majors and just the, the, the worldly benefits of being a major league player are much different than in the minors. You're not taking those bus rides through the night, you know, at, at three in the morning, you're on a, you're on a flight, you're going on, you're, you're traveling to a, another city and it's, you know, really good accommodations. But as you look back now, just even a couple of years and appreciating the moments where you've had that opportunity to pitch in the majors, what's the great thing that, that stands out from you that, you know, God has shown you and blessed you with through those couple of years uh, now that you look back? Yeah, I think, you know, at the risk of sounding like I'm, I'm privileged, I feel like I've been able to have enough success to realize that success doesn't really matter as much as you think it does. Mm. And, you know, being in the big leagues for a, a couple of years, I haven't made like a ridiculous amount of money, but I, I've made enough money to feel like I'm secure in that and realizing that that also doesn't bring you as much life as you think it does. And so when you're in the minor leagues and you're, striving and you're pushing you're trying to do all this stuff so that you can become like a millionaire or you know be successful and have this like you know perfect career um i think you i've been lucky enough to have just enough success to realize that that doesn't bring you as much life as you think it does and really like the most impactful moments are like all the relationships i've had the guys i've lived with and being like just you know being in it with them being it like I was texting a guy the other day. Um, we, were, we were in Reading. He used to play these weird, like, remix songs on the radio, on the stereo in our small clubhouse in Reading. And it was, like, <laughs> hilarious. And he'd be, like, doing, like, these dances and stuff. They were just, like, so over the top. But, like, he was just trying to keep it loose. And, like, looking back, even though I'm still in the middle of my career, looking back, like, those are the moments that are, like, the most impactful ones. And it's not, you know, there's there's been a lot of cool times on the field where, you know, I – had some type of success or came into a big spot and got out of it. And those are really fun and like huge adrenaline hit. But you know, that success isn't like one, you can't sustain it Two, you're going to be done playing at some point. So you just can't like hold on to that forever. But the relationships you build with guys um, and just the, like the joy of getting to be, able to be able to do it for your job, like that's enough, you know, like whether I'm successful or not, just getting to be around the guys and getting to play is like awesome. And then to try and make an impact off the field wherever I can and use that platform, as they say, um, is something that I really, really enjoy doing. 
He is Austin Davis with the Philadelphia Phillies. This has been great, my friend. Thanks so much for joining us and continued success to you. Hopefully we'll get you back on uh, another time and share some more stories. Appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been fun. And many thanks to Austin Davis for joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. He's got some great stories, right? The one where he's on the bus and it breaks down and he's on the side of the road. His wife's driving completely in the opposite end of where she's supposed to be going to meet him in Reading, Pennsylvania. And, you know, this is not uh, glamorous. I, I, I said that and it really isn't. The minor league baseball life is not glamorous, but it's so cool to watch these guys battle through to continue to grind and to achieve that dream that Austin was able to achieve, and nobody can ever take that away from him, uh, making that Major League Baseball debut June 20th, 2018, with the Phillies against the St. Louis Cardinals. Austin Davis, we wish him nothing but the best and appreciate him joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. We also appreciate our sponsors, IJM, the International Justice Mission, helping to end slavery in our lifetime. You can join IJM in the fight against violence and oppression. Visit their website, ijm.org slash tf, ijm.org slash tf to become a freedom partner today. Make sure you go check out our website as well, sportspectrum.com. That's the home base for all of our content here at the Ministry of Sports Spectrum. And then when you get a chance, whatever app that you're listening to this podcast on, many people listen to it on Spotify, on Google Play, on iHeartRadio, and even Apple Podcasts. Hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast. And then if you're on Apple's podcast app, leave a review if you could. It just helps get the word out by simply clicking a review. You can get the stars there. Just click the star, whether it's a five-star review, a four-star review, and let people know. It helps let people know about Sports Spectrum and the ministry of our Sports Spectrum podcast. So again, we appreciate you. We love you guys. We hope you all tune in next time for another episode here on Sports Spectrum, and I do hope you all have a great rest of your day.